we have a great guest on. I've been talking about this article in Ars Technica ever since it came out about three weeks ago. And I told, I told our team, I said, get these guys, get this guy on. It's the only article I've ever read that fully explains why Wi-Fi doesn't work these days. Jim Salter's on the line. He, by his own description, is a mercenary sysadmin, a contributor to Ars Technica, an expert on networking. Hey, Jim, welcome to the new Screensavers. I appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Leo. Glad to be here. So why does... <laughs> That's a question, big question. The big question. Wi-Fi wi worked great when it first came out. 802.11b, uh, when we first got it, it was great. Nobody was using it. I, had, I didn't have to put wires in the wall. I was thrilled. And it just successively got worse and worse and worse. We got A, we got B, A, N, G, and now A, C. And instead of getting better and faster, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Why? Well, from my perspective, I don't know that I would agree that it used to be fine and then it got worse. It sucked from day one. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> I just was just happy. trying to do much with it back then. Yeah. Uh, the, a lot of the problem is that it, you know, Wi-Fi is marketed with these numbers that are basically intended to compete with wired networking and make it look like, oh, you know, Wi-Fi is just as good as plugging in the wire. And they're entirely different technologies with entirely different problems. Um, well, basically, so the first thing I learned from your article is that it's a collision-based network. In other words, if you can see somebody else's Wi-Fi access point, yeah. you're competing with them for airtime. If they're talking and you start, your Wi-Fi access point starts talking, it goes, oops, sorry, and shuts up for a random period of time to let them finish. Well, it has to. Uh, if it doesn't, then nobody gets any data across. Then it's just shouting, everybody's shouting. In fact, you have a great analogy. It's like being in a bar. If it's right. just the two of us talking, we can hear each other, hear but each more other. people come in, they, they start making noise, so we raise our voice, which makes it noisier, so they raise their voice. Pretty soon everybody's shouting and nobody's hearing. Right. Which, luckily, luckily that's not the way it works with Wi-Fi. With Wi-Fi, you actually have to be polite, and uh, your device has to let other devices speak. Um, it would be worse if they didn't do that. You just have right. to realize that, yes, this is the case. Well, in fact, it, it explains a lot to me because we won't let, for instance, we have a lot of Skype callers here on Skype. What do we always tell you? Wired, right? Wired, yeah. And that's because we noticed that Skype would just drop out every once in a while, and that right. must be why, right? It just it stopped transmitting. Well, Wi-Fi is so weird compared to wired networking. Um, some of the tests that I run when I'm testing these devices, I have a, a real-time progress bar. As I'm running the test, I can see, you know, am I do I have fast speed or slow speed? And literally, if my cat runs through the room, <laughs> I can see the numbers dip. I'm not really? kidding. Because it's bouncing yeah. off the cat. The cat is interfering with the radio frequencies. You get a little bit of attenuation, or wow. maybe it changes the RF multipath. It's not, I mean, it's not so a huge difference. if I had 12 difference. cats, it would be really bad. How many do you More have? More cats, worse thing. Well, right. I have two children and a dog, so I'm not sure what that counts But we're all cats, sacks but... of water, which are bad yeah. for radio, right? Correct. Yeah, we yeah a it. human body is good for about 3 dBm of attenuation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just so roughly the same the as an interior wall. So, so when, when I'm I... in the hotel and I'm like trying to stick my arms out to make better Wi-Fi signal, I'm not doing a good job of that. <laughs> no, for the most part, you're just making yourself feel better because <laughs> yeah. okay. you have something you. to do. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that. And this is good because now I can tell my son, you're blocking the Wi-Fi. Get out of the way. Right. Just Don't like you tried. Just like yeah, I mean, you, you can. It's, like I said, you know, a human body is about equivalent to an interior wall in terms of attenuation. Wow. wow. So the solution we've come up with, and I think for the most part this is a lot better, is are these new mesh networks. The first one uh, we learned about was Eero, of course, one of our sponsors, Eero. Uh, but there are many of these. The folks at Ubiquiti who created the first enterprise version of these mesh networks, or one of the early ones, now has a consumer-grade product called the Amplify. Uh, this is the Amplify HD, which I understand is a little bit faster and better. It's really cool looking. Um, then there's Google in the in the business. They have the least expensive offering. We have prices on here. This is $300 for three base units. Um, and I have my Orbi. This is what I use at home. But you tell me this isn't really mesh. This is just a kind of more traditional router with a satellite unit. Well, I, I hate to say that. At this point, I think mesh has effectively been defined in the consumer space as you have more than one AP and you don't have to plug <laughs> wires into the other ones. Right. Um, you, you shouldn't even try to, to dial it in any further than that if you're talking about consumer products. They're not really mesh, in other words, in, this, in the way that, say, an ubiquity enterprise uh, system is a mesh system. 
Uh, it, you know, if you want to try to get into the the more professional, you know, like Wi-Fi engineer terminology, yeah. then mesh is going to mean that you've got a complex topology and you can get back to the router more than one way. The satellites all talk to one another and they figure out their own best path. And Plume that's, does that. Plume's yeah. about the only one that does that in the that, consumer That's space. kind of the key on some of these is you can connect like the Euro or the Plume. You can connect them to Ethernet. Um, so mm -hmm. they don't just have to be a repeater of one base station. You could have multiple base stations, but it still creates one network with one SSID, one password, and the handoff yes. is handled transparently by these devices. So that's the, one of the benefits of, of these systems? Well, the more wired backhaul you have, the better. Okay. Um, the, basically, the, the biggest thing that will improve Wi-Fi performance is not using Wi-Fi. And <laughs> plugging a wire into the back of your access point is one way to limit better. how much Wi-Fi you're using. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah. so if I'm in a like, so I have like a, a three-floor home with lots of walls. What would I choose to use to be able to have my children who are now on Wi-Fi? My husband and I, we both use quite a lot of bandwidth, and like the walls are kind of like this plaster wood kind of thing. What would I choose to go with in that type of a scenario? You've got a couple of options there. Um, the uh, if you've got the old plaster like lathe type of walls, worse the ones with the chicken wire in them are you know they have metal. There's metal in the walls. It's uh, like a Faraday cage. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You, you've got two approaches. <laughs> One would be Orbi, like Leo's got, which Orbi has just a ridiculously high signal strength and may be able to punch through those walls. So this one's shouting. <laughs> yeah, but the better approach might be Plume, which has a lot of these little pods, and you've got a better shot at being able to. Uh, get a signal from one pod to another through open doorways and whatever, and hopefully not actually have to go through as many walls. And again, with Plume, with like hop. the others, if you have an Ethernet port uh, in one of these rooms, you can connect it as well, and it will still be all part of the network. One downside yes, to Plume is it all of them have a single Ethernet port, so you can't, uh, as you can together. with, right, you can't use <coughs> them as you would the Eero or the Orbeez. Or right. In fact, all of these have multiple Ethernet ports, so you can use a switch off of them and have wired networking as well. Right. This, this really, you'd need your own switch uh, and then connect this uh, to your network via the switch and then have this be a, kind of a separate, you know, Wi-Fi only uh, network. So, how, so I do like these because they're pretty and you they're just pretty. plug them into the wall. Um, and one of the things I got, I think, from your article, and I probably misunderstood this too, so you correct me if I'm wrong, is that the best way to do Wi-Fi is to whisper, in effect, that if you yes. use 5G, which doesn't go through walls as well, and you create pools of Wi-Fi in the rooms you want, that you'll do better than trying to blast Wi-Fi throughout the whole house. Is that accurate? That, that's absolutely accurate, but the devices have to actually set it up properly. Some are better at it than others. Uh, Plume is incredibly good at that because it tries to use all of the spectrum that it can with the individual pods on different channels. So if you're streaming, you know, 4K Netflix onto a TV in the living room and you're trying to download something with a tablet, uh, you know, your kid or your wife is, you know, over in the bedroom, you're not going to be actually competing between those two devices because they're using different channels and they're not contending with one another for the Wi-Fi bandwidth. That's one of the things all of these offer as well, is the automatic, automatic switching between 2 and 5 gigahertz, uh, automatic switching between channels. They handle all of that transparently, so you don't have to. I have an old Asus router where you've got three you know, uh, bands, two 5G and one 2.4, <laughs> right. and you have to pick the one you want to be on. That's not as good as being able to hand off and be intelligent about how the network's managed. Correct. And, you know, that's another thing that differentiates these mesh products is how well they handle routing and band steering. And uh, Plume gets uh, Plume gets nailed a lot in the press because it doesn't have the biggest raw throughput numbers. But it's incredibly good with do handing off a device as you walk through the house from one pod to another. Most of these devices, you know, they're, they're either pretty good at roaming or they just absolutely are terrible at it, you know, like old school routers. Right. I actually wrote a script on my test laptop when I test these devices that goes bing every time the laptop goes from one access point to another. And it kind of freaks the kids out when I'm walking through the house testing these things. And, you know, with Plume, like literally I'm walking from room to room and it's just going bing, bing, bing. Interesting. You know, going from one to the next Interesting. without any intervention on my part at all. Now, I, uh, uh, you know, I use the Eero uh, in, in, at my mom's house. It's, what I've noticed is that 
different ones work better in different environments. Mm. Is that mm -hmm. is that possible? I'm I'm thinking that if you're like one person in a concrete bunker, the Orbi would be the way to go. <laughs> well, right? this is what I use at home, but I think I'm doing it for the wrong reason because I did a, a, a you know speed test on this, and it was twice as fast as anything else. The plume was 120 megabits. This is 240 megabits. But you were only use, you were the only one testing it at the time. Well, was exactly. Multiple tests. Is that is that why? Yeah, exactly. Uh, multiple devices are going to favor plume setup much better than just got it. A so single, if it was like, just if it's just you and you want now. the best throughput, this would be great. But if you have yeah. multiple people and you're roaming and, uh, and 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 who doesn't nowadays have a lot of stuff? I also notice I have a lot of other Wi-Fi things on my network that I didn't even know about. The Roku's, for instance, set up Wi-Fi right. Direct. They're Wi-Fi access points. Get out of my network, Roku. I'm not going to use Wi-Fi Direct. You can't disable it. Yeah, no, you can't. Well, the the uh, remote controls for the Roku are also 2.4 gigahertz wireless. So that's yeah. why I try to use 5 mostly, right? Yeah, well, 5 is a lot better um, as long as you can connect to the 5 because right. you don't have the range and throughput. Well, that sounds like a bug, but it's really a feature because since you don't have the range and penetration, yeah. that means you don't have as many things competing for you on 5. That's the key. So you're, what you want to create is... If you think of it as light, little pools of light in each room, right? Uh, and they're kind of discreet; they don't go beyond the room. Uh, you're not getting interfered with other people because their five gigahertz Wi-Fi of you know the neighbors isn't getting into your house either. Uh, in, so, in some ways, it's counterintuitive, but the low the, the this low range of the higher frequency is actually good. Yes, especially if you live in an apartment complex. If you live in an apartment complex, you do not want to be using equipment with a ton of range and penetration. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So have you tried, I mean, we're looking at the Amplify from Ubiquiti, the Google Wi-Fi, the Orbi, the Eero, and the Plume. You've tried these all? I've spent ridiculous amounts of time <laughs> testing all those and more, yeah. Is there, are there noticeable differences between them? Absolutely. Uh, very big differences. Like I said, one of the things that uh, people really notice, and that's one thing you have to look at is, are we talking about a difference when I'm sitting here with my laptop camped out next to an access point, running speed tests, trying to get a big number to talk to my friends about, or are you talking about differences hey. actually living with and using the equipment? Well, that's, that's, what, that's what I want. I want like a little cheat sheet. So I have like bunker for zombie apocalypse, the yep, Orbi. That's the I Orbi. have the house with lots of cats. We have the plume. The plume. What would be yeah. the use cases for the- In my experience, the Google Wi-Fi is the least of uh, good of all of these. I was just not happy with the wi no. Google Wi-Fi that because much. How about you, Jim? I would put an Amplify HT at the bottom of the, the crop that you've got there on the table. Amplify is the, you'd think it'd be the best. It's from the company that's been doing this longer than anybody else. Ubiquity. You would think so. I love Ubiquity's UAP access points, yep. but I just, I feel like they missed pretty badly with Amplify. Oh, that's too bad. There's 200, 350 bucks down the tube. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, it's still going to be a big improvement over whatever crap router you got lying actually, around the house. That's a that really good point. Placed with I actually have a but, good, better than nothing. I have a good Asus, uh, you know, AC whatever it is, 5200 router that I really like mm -hmm. that served me well for a while, but none of them, I mean, all of these are better than that, which is weird because, you know, I mean, sure. that, that was a high-end device. What, what's the arm for on this? What's the use of the, the small? <laughs> you can, did you break it? I did. <laughs> you broke it? Yeah, you can pull it apart. Never going to have me back, back I'm sorry. You broke it. No, it's it comes off. off. It comes it does off. Pull. Yeah, yeah oh, okay. just pull it. It's just it a magnet. Right off. Yeah. It's magnetic. It's yeah. kind of fun to play with. <laughs> Oh, that scared the life out of me. I was like, I'm just going to so put it that's back. A like, tuna, it. That's an aimable antenna. Is that just a gimmick? Well, you know, usually the antennas are a complete lie. You know, you get these okay. uh, routers that are just bristling with yeah. antennas. So the, yeah, my, my, my ASUS has six antennas. It looks like an upside down spider. The, the so ASUS is a thing. lie and the antenna is a lie. <laughs> Yeah, they're all they. You can wiggle them around, and they really are antennas. But yeah. they're omnidirectional. There's oh. almost no difference in oh. anything you can do. I feel like such a but, sucker. <laughs> now here's the <laughs> thing: cool. the amplify. Yeah. Those mesh points actually are directional. Now the question is: is that a feature or is it a bug? Because uh, the uh, <laughs> the most signal comes out of the front of that little mesh point, not oh. the back or the tops or the side. Oh. So oh, as so you, you aim it. it, yes, you are blasting out more signal that way. But you have no way of marking where your perfect, awesome orientation that you right. theoretically figured out was. So, you know, what happens when your kid or your dog or your roommate or whatever knocks it and changes it? Uh, you know, how are you going to get that back? So you tried them all. 
Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the ones you're using at home are the plume. And is this your actually, general recommendation? Right now, I'm using Ubiquity access points at home uh, with wired backhaul. I'm probably going to start using Plume for real because my editors really? at the wire cutter would like me to dog food it. Really? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we want to do we we like to do long-term testing and uh I'll be honest with you, my editor at the wire cutter has been kind of dubious about me singing the praises of Plume because everybody, you know, says, "Oh, well the throughput's so low." And I keep saying that's not really what this is about. That's what I noticed. So, it felt it seemed like it was slower, but because it's it's better for multiple devices and it's spread out yeah. i got one per room and which is what their recommendation is they don't get outside the room that you're in pretty much mm. how do they well, what's I, the back what's the back hall though if they i mean how do they talk to one another uh they're dual band devices ac 1200 they each have a 2.4 gigahertz radio and a 5 gigahertz radio yeah and uh, if you find the little topograph on there in the article it actually shows you what the back hall looks like it, on their app uh -huh. it does too i don't really understand what it is it looks like one of those yeah. weird uh, kind of uh multicellular organisms about to, about to separate. <laughs> it decides whether uh, it wants to use 2.4 or 5 for the backhaul on there each individual that's pod it. talking to the other pods. Okay. Um, that's that's the app view right there. The yeah. uh, the bigger view lo lower down in the article was from their actual knock, and it's it's a little bit better because you can actually see what channels it's using. So the wavy so line is the backhaul or the direct? No, the squiggly line shows that that's a 2.4 gigahertz Got connection, it. and the straight ones are 5 gigahertz. Got it. Okay. So if you look, you'll see like Jim's office is connected on 153 to the den, which is connected on channel 11, oh, that's which is 2.4. So they choose not only the, the frequency, they choose the, the channel as well to make it. They, they work choose the, the best. frequency, the, uh, they choose the topology, you know, which wow. pods connect to which. You don't manage any of that, it does it all for you. How about uh, firmware updates? Do you think they're pretty good in terms of keeping these up to date and uh, improving the, the quality as time goes by? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, they spend a lot of time on that and they actually have uh, three different pools. Um, they have basically two different kinds of beta pool that uh, mostly people who work for Plume might be in. And then they've got a production and they'll test out optimizer rules on the, uh, you know, basically call it the alpha and the beta before they decide if they like it and they push it out to production. So they do like much more aggressive things to their own devices that might have consequences. Test them out there and uh, th then once they, they know it all works, they push it out to their customers. Well, I really appreciate this. It, it, again, thank you for writing an article that, uh, at least uh, to my limited ability, explains why Wi-Fi is so bad. That's on Ars Technica. Uh, also, direct reviews. And I take it we're going to look for your wire cutter review uh, of the plume. Will it be the wire cutter's recommendation? Uh, well, you know, the, uh, the wire cutter's mesh guide is the first version of it is already out. It's a few months old now. The update is going to push... Uh, probably next week, maybe the week after, and I don't think I'm allowed to tell you oh, yet. Oh man, but it's going to be the number one. You have to wait. Right. I will. Wait I will, to will tell you. You know, the top two. Obviously, you've been talking to me. You know, the two that I like are Orbi and Plume. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you, Jim, for writing such a great article and for uh, coming on and giving us a little more clarity on to why Wi-Fi is so bad and some hope that it can be better with uh, you know the right Wi-Fi router and those mesh routers are better.